and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in introducing my friend Christopher Bryant. He is a member of the Society of St. John the Evangelist, Cowley Fathers. He is very widely known for his spiritual direction and the books he has written, and also for the fact that he is the author, or rather the editor, of one of the most important religious journals in the Anglican tradition called New Fire. If you are not aware of this, I hope that eventually at least you will read it. It is so broad, comprehensive and enjoyable that you cannot help being edified by its contents. His great interest has always been the relationship between psychology and religion with special reference to Jung, and he has written four books. The first was Depth Psychology and Religious Belief, the second The River Within, the third The Heart in Pilgrimage, and the last one, which has attained considerable esteem, Jung and the Christian Way. He also has spoken to the Guild of Pastoral Psychology and copies of a recent talk he gave on individuation and salvation are available behind. It gives me great pleasure to ask him to speak on the theme of the cloud of unknown. Thank you very much, Martin. I look upon it as a piece of good fortune that the invitation to speak at this annual conference has given me the incentive to think over and study again a book that has for many years been an inspiration to me. The late Professor David Knowles, an authority on medieval and especially of monastic history, as well as a writer on mysticism, has said of the author of The Cloud of Unknowing that he has some claim to be considered the most subtle and incisive as well as the most original spiritual writer in the English language. The 14th century in which he lived was a troubled time in England. It was the century of King Edward III and most of the Hundred Years' War with France. It was the century in which the mysterious epidemic known as the Black Death decimated Europe, completely wiped out the population of considerable number of English villages, and reduced the number of clergy by a half. It was a time of great social unrest among the peasantry and of the first great peasants' revolt. For the people of that century, death was an ever-present reality. In spite of that, or perhaps partly because of it, the century saw a remarkable flowering of mystical religion. It was the century of St. Catherine of Siena, and of the so-called Rhineland mystics, Eckhart, Tala, Suzo, and Roisbrook. In England, it was the century of Richard Rowe, Walter Hilton, Julian of Norwich, and of the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, possibly the greatest of them all. His name is unknown to us, like that of the famous anchoress of Norwich, who is named after the church of St. Julian, where she lived. Practically all that is known of him is what can be deduced from his writings. From these we know him as a wise, forceful, and confident counselor with a racy and vigorous style. He has a single message which he delivers with an assurance which we feel must come from personal experience of what he preaches. In addition to the cloud, he wrote a number of minor works of which the principal is the Letter of Privy Council, which is rarely an appendix to the cloud. They are written some years later. It takes the spiritual teaching a bit further. David knows thinks it's probable that he took a deliberate steps to remain anonymous. He was a man of some learning, and it's likely that he was a master of arts and a priest. 
He may have been a Dominican, for he was plainly influenced by the Rhineland mystics who belonged to the Dominican order. In matters then under dispute, he follows the teaching of the great Dominican thinker and teacher of the previous century, St. Thomas Aquinas. It's likely that he lived a life of solitary. But all this is conjecture. What is certain is that the cloud of unknowing became popular as soon as it was known. It was certainly known to his younger contemporary, Walter Hilton. Manuscripts of it travelled rapidly around the country. It was well known in the 15th and 16th centuries. It has won many readers in our own day. And a version in which the English has been modernised has appeared as a penguin classic. I have said that our anonymous author's teaching is traditional. Before looking at the specific teaching of the cloud of unknowing, it will therefore be worthwhile reminding ourselves of some of the elements of the Christian mystical tradition which he takes for granted. A fundamental axiom of Christian theology is that men and women are created to find their fulfillment and happiness only in union with God. Nothing less than this can permanently satisfy. So the Augustine has stated this truth in well-known words, Lord, you've made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. Most people are, of course, unaware of their true nature and destiny. All they are generally conscious of is a dissatisfaction with other goals, of a restless search for success, for wealth, for security, fame, domestic bliss, or perhaps some social goal, such as the success or glory of their family or their country. Mankind will search in vain for its heart's desire if God did not awaken those who were ready to be woken up to his reality and overflowing goodness. To those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, in every race, God reveals something of his loving kindness according to their capacity to receive it and coloured inevitably by the presuppositions of their religious culture. God's supreme self-disclosure has been, we believe, in Jesus Christ. Through union with him, so as Christian tradition understands it, men and women are brought into union with God as his sons and daughters through faith and love. The Christian life, then, is a response to God, a growing up into an ever-deepening love for and trust in God. The contemplative way of which our author writes in the cloud is just one way to which only a small minority of mankind is called of living this life of trust and love towards God. I prefer myself to speak of the contemplative rather than the mystical way because mysticism has come to have so many different meanings from nature mysticism and the sense of the infinite to Zen. There are indeed also many kinds of contemplation. Thomas Aquinas, one of our author's authorities, speaks of contemplation as a simple intuition of truth. There is an intellectual contemplation reached by one who, having long wrestled with a problem, suddenly sees the truth and rests in it without any further need of argument or reasoning. The distinctive feature of Christian contemplation is that the truth gazed upon is perceived only by faith, uh, by faith and love. An intense love welling up from the heart of the believer 
enlightens the intelligence which is now flooded with a new knowledge which no longer comes from discursive reasoning. It's an intuitive knowledge. It's a kind of wisdom which only love can engender. Superior to logical thinking, it's perhaps best understood as a deepening and intensification of the loving trust in God which all genuine Christians have in some degree. The Christian contemplative is a believer who loves God so intensely that his love takes on a highly experimental character coming to possess his whole being. Something like this is the taken-for-granted background of our author's teaching. He's writing not for all and sundry, but in the first place for a young man of 24 who's probably had some training with the Carthusians and is at the time living as a solitary and, of course, for others living a similar kind of life. His, orig his originality lies largely in the simplicity and force of his teaching and his deep psychological insights, which astonish us, astonishes us today with its modern ring. He seeks to guide his readers to an intuitive knowledge of God. Carl Jung has described intuition as knowledge through the unconscious. The intuitive knows without being able to say how he knows. He has a kind of blind knowledge, a feeling of certainty, which he's unable to justify rationally. The difficulty with the unconscious, of course, is that it's not under the direct control of our will. However, we can exercise some indirect control to the right image or symbol. A symbol, by focusing the imagination, can speak to our depths, engage our emotions, and release energy in a way that no effort could bring about. Our author offers us the symbol of a cloud, or rather two related symbols, the cloud of unknowing and the cloud of forgetting. He tells us to immerse all thoughts, memories, and imaginings in a cloud of forgetting. This is in order to give our attention to the other cloud, the cloud of unknowing. This cloud, of course, is a, a metaphor, a symbol, speaks both of our blindness and ignorance and also of God himself. In the Bible, a cloud, the Shekinah, is a symbol of the divine presence. God, as he is, lies wholly beyond the grasp of man's intelligence. Confronted with God's presence, our minds are in the dark. Our rational faculties are baffled, but intuition senses in the darkness a reality which fascinates and attracts. The late Professor Hodges has written of this. It's a step forward when we realize that our failure to see God is not due to any cloud which comes between and blocks the view, but to God himself, who is by his very nature invisible to us. He is himself the darkness, and we can see him as such. The image now is not that we are in a mist which we cannot pierce, but that we are seeing, as it were, before us a pool of blank darkness and know intuitively that that is God. We know something else too, that this darkness is the formless source of all form and the invisible source of all light. For we know that what we are thus seeing is the infinite, 
And this is the most appropriate way for us to apprehend the infinite as darkness, not the darkness of mere non-entity, but of a fullness which defeats our attempts at vision. I say that we know this intuitively, but sometimes it can feel as if knowledge is being beamed into us from the darkness itself. I have quoted Professor Hodges at some length to show that a modern Christian philosopher can use language strikingly similar to that of the cloud in speaking of our approach to God. Our author, though he is emphatic that we are powerless to grasp God by our thinking, tells us that there is a way of drawing near to God, the way of trust and love. He may well be loved but not thought, he writes. And though it be good sometimes to think of the goodness and worthiness of God in special, and though it be a light and a part of contemplation, nevertheless, in this work, it shall be cast down and covered with a cloud of forgetting. And thou shalt step above it stalwartly and zealously with a devout and pleasing stirring of love and try to pierce that darkness above thee and smite upon the thick cloud of unknowing with a sharp dart of longing love and go not thence for aught that befall us. The work of contemplation, as he understands it, is carried out between two clouds, the cloud of forgetting below and the cloud of unknowing above. Although this yearning for union with God, this sharp dart of longing love, is deeply congenial to our nature, <clears throat> the fact is obscured by the spiritual sickness known as original sin. <coughs> An essential part of the work of contemplation is the facing and battling with this inherited sickness. Our author sums up the virtue or strength needed for this comfort as meekness. Meekness, he explains, is naught else but a true knowing and feeling of a man's self as he is. For surely, Whoso might verily see and feel himself as he is, he should verily be meeked. Humility, in other words, springs from self-knowledge, but it has another <clears throat> and more important source in the awareness of the abundant and overflowing love of God. He contrasts imperfect meekness, the meekness which springs from the sharp sense of what we are, with the perfect meekness which flows from the ever overwhelming realization of God's immense love. This realization, which is a foretaste of the bliss of heaven, is granted normally only for a brief space of time, for minutes and seconds rather than hours. But during that time, a person loses all feeling of himself and is aware only of God and his superabundant goodness. The effect of the love he feels for God makes him open not only to God, but to all his fellows, his enemies no less than his friends. But he can only hope to retain this meekness and openness if he labors to deepen his awareness of his soul sickness, frailty and sin. Therefore, our author writes, swink and sweat in all that thou canst, for to get thee a true knowing and feeling of thyself as thou art. And then I trow, soon after that, thou wilt get thee a true knowing and feeling of God as he is. Not as he is in himself, for that no man may do but himself nor yet as thou shalt do in, the, in bliss, but as it is possible 
and as he vouchsafed to be known and felt by a meek soul in his mortal body. As I said just now, what our author calls meekness is an essential quality for the work of contemplation. But the work itself causes meekness together with other virtues, especially charity, to root themselves in the person who contemplates. Again, the quotation, and as it is said of meekness, how that it is perfectly and subtly comprehended in this little blind love set on God, when it is beating on this dark cloud of unknowing, all other things being put down and forgotten, so it is to be understood of all other virtues, and in particular of charity. For charity means naught el or else but love of God for himself above all creatures, and men for God's sake, even as thyself. And that in this work God is love for himself, and above all creatures it seemeth right well. For as it is said before, the substance of this work is naught else but a naked intent unto God himself. This naked intent is an intent unclothed with any ulterior motive, a desire for God without any personal strings attached. Our author goes on to say that in the time of this work a person has no special regard unto any man by himself, whether he be kin or stranger, friend or foe. All men he thinketh to be his friends, and none his foes, insomuch that he thinketh all those that pain him and do him hurt in this life, that they be his full and special friends, and he thinketh that he is stirred to will them as much good as he would to the dearest friends that he hath. During the actual work of contemplation, the blind stirring of love, can swallow up all a man's feelings towards his fellows. But outside the work, he must do his best to bring his natural feelings of liking and dislike into harmony with his loving attachment to God and his will. The work gives a great impulse towards a loving and peaceful attitude in all circumstances. Our author regularly refers to contemplation as work and gives repeated warnings that it is a hard and sometimes painful work. The difficulty is principally due to the constant battle to beat down thoughts and memories, both good and bad, that distract from attention to God. He offers two pieces of advice to those engaged in the fight with distractions. The unwanted thoughts and images are best not tackled head-on. Two practical hints are offered about how to deal with distractions when they are very pressing. Do your best to pretend as though thou knewest not that they pressed so far upon thee betwixt thee and thy God. And try to look, as it were, over their shoulders, seeking another thing, the which thing is God enclosed in a cloud of unknowing. He tells us, in other words, to avoid direct confrontation with the distractions, to quietly ignore them and turn the weight of our attention on to the cloud of unknowing, which is God, and to the little blind stirring of love towards him. If this fails, and the desires and imaginings contrary to the work seem overwhelming, he offers another piece of advice. Cower down under them like a caitiff and a coward, overcome in battle, and think that it is but folly to strive any longer with them. And therefore thou yieldest thyself to God in the midst of thine enemies. He goes on to explain that this is, in fact, to realize what we are in ourselves. Further, 
this knowing and feeling of a man's self as he is is a sure way to the knowing and feeling of God as he is. There is much psychological wisdom in these two pieces of advice. Behind the distracting thoughts, memories and impulses, there lie emotions and desires as yet unintegrated. The effect of trying by an exercise of will to suppress the rebel impulses <coughs> and emotions is to make them return with redoubled force, just as the harder you throw a rubber ball on the ground, the higher it will bounce. The surest way of coping with these unwelcome distractions is to tolerate their existence while at the same time holding fast to God. Our author further gives practical advice about the use of words in this work of contemplation. He quotes the ancient maxim that short prayer pierces heaven and recommends the prayer of the little word, preferably a monosyllable such as God or love. Its shortness expresses urgency and further allows no time for distracting reflections. The little word springs from the heart. The heart knows its meaning without the explanations of the reasoning intelligence. If we feel love towards God, we are not, he urges, to express it boisterously, but rather pretend to conceal it from God and uh, out of shyness. The little blind stirring of love towards God springs up of itself like a flame in the heart. The pretended concealment of our devotion is likely to feed this secret flame, while the boisterous and fervent expression uh, is likely to quench it. I said earlier that some of the teaching of our 14th century author strikingly resembles, though in a wholly different mode, certain of the ideas of the 20th century psychologist Carl Jung. Of course, prayer is an entering into communion with God and therefore belongs partly to a region beyond the competence of psychology to speak about. But prayer is also a human experience and therefore a fitting object for psychological scrutiny. And certainly speaking of myself, I have to confess that um, Jung has helped to make real to me certain truths about God's providence at work in my own life. Our medieval author's insistence that it is through coming to know and feel ourselves as we are that we come to a real experience of God reminds me irresistibly of Jung's similar linking of what he calls the self with the experience of God. The self for Jung refers to the total personality, both that part of ourselves of which we are conscious and also the vast reaches of the unconscious. The name itself describes a double experience. Sometimes it's felt as the pressure of the, on the conscious person of a larger whole of which it is a part, sometimes as a magnetic source of attraction within the center of the psyche. He further sees this pressure as divine and sometimes calls it God. It seems better to me to regard the self as a principal means by which God makes his presence and providence known. Certainly this experience was very important to Jung. Writing in old age, he speaks of a sense of destiny which gripped him in, in his youth. Nobody could rid me of the conviction that it was enjoined upon me to do what God wanted, not what I wanted. This gave me the strength to go my own way. Often I had the feeling that in all decisive matters I was no longer among men but was alone with God. And when I was there, 
where I was no longer alone. I was outside time. I belonged to the centuries, and he who then gave answer was he who had always been, who had been before my birth. He who always is was there. These talks with the other were my profoundest experiences. On the one hand, a bloody struggle. On the other, supreme ecstasy. These experiences long predated his theory of the self, which was developed to give an intelligible account of it. It was this strong religious sense that was the principal cause of his breach with Freud after six years of close collaboration with him. Freud regarded God as a father substitute who helped the individual to feel safe when he could no longer rely <coughs> on his actual father to protect him. Jung turned this idea upside down. He came to believe that there was an inborn tendency, or archetype as he called it, prompting us to search for an absolute and totally trustworthy authority. In other words, for God. The parents, or one of them, are usually the first objects upon which this inborn tendency fastens. So far from God being a father substitute, it would be truer to say that the father is a God substitute. The little blind stirring of love, of which our medieval author writes, is an expression of this innate God instinct. The little blind stirring of love is indeed a grace and a gift, but grace perfects and enables nature and does not work contrary to it. <coughs> This stirring of love is also uh, related to what Jung called <clears throat> the archetype of the child. By this he means the instinctive tendency to respond with love and trust to a parental presence. This tendency lives on after we've grown out of childhood into the responsibility of adulthood. It is as though there is a child in us and this childlike thing in us must be accepted and allowed its place in our conscious attitude. It will give an element of youth and spontaneity to our life and enable us to grow to our full human stature. Contemplative prayer expresses and deepens this childlike element within us. But before this can come about in Jung's teaching, we have to confront what he calls the shadow, those elements of the personality that have been rejected as incompatible with the personality ideal. These rejected elements, childish rage and aggression, violent loves and hates, depression, childish fear and anxiety, these childish things, though consciously put away, live on as resistance movement threatening the conscious aim and ideals. These shadow elements, though they seem evil, contain elements necessary for true development. The rebel elements have to be owned and accepted before a person can grow to his full human stature. Jung says of this difficult task, the shadow is a moral problem that challenges the whole ego personality, for no one can, come, can become conscious of a shadow without considerable moral effort. To become conscious of it involves recognizing the dark elements of the personality as present and real. This act is the essential condition for any kind of self-knowledge, and it therefore, as a rule, meets with considerable resistance. 
there's a quotation from Jung, all this reminds me strongly of swink and sweat in all that thou canst and for to get thee a true knowing and feeling of thyself as thou art. I've been able to give no more than the barest hints as to the parallels and resemblances between the medieval cloud of unknowing and the 20th century psychology of Jung. I must now, in conclusion, consider the relevance of the cloud to the lives of 20th century people. The author of the cloud is emphatic that his book is for the tiny minority of people who are called to the life of contemplation and are living in a, mon in a monastic community or as a solitary under the guidance of an experienced spiritual director. He was anxious that his writing should not fall into the hands of those who might misunderstand them and take harm from them. In his day, before the invention of printing, when books were an expensive rarity and the great majority of people illiterate, it was not unrealistic to hope to confine his writings to the readership he had in mind. What, I wonder, would he have thought of a time like our own of universal literacy and the mass circulation of books? At any rate, there is no possibility of limiting the readership of his books to a tiny minority of suitable people. It's more to the point to consider the possible dangers of the way of contemplation for people today and the safeguards against the dangers. For it seems that many people today, perhaps a growing number, are being drawn to seek a direct experience of the transcendent. Some of them are exploring Eastern techniques of contemplation such as Zen, yoga, and transcendental meditation, to name three of the best known of the movements which teach contemplative meditation. Not a few Christians have claimed that one or other of these movements has helped them to a more specifically Christian contemplation. One of the dangers our author had in mind was the sheer ignorance of people in an age of illiteracy when bizarre and superstitious notions of the spiritual life were in circulation. This danger is less today when virtually everyone can read and there is a multitude of books to consult. Another and more pressing danger is that the way of unknowing with its suppression of memories, thoughts and imaginings leaves the conscious mind a blank and exposes the individual to the uprush into consciousness of repressed um, emotions and impulses, waves of fear and anxiety, of rage and resentment, of erotic emotion, of depression, are liable to flood into consciousness. It's part of the contemplative way to battle with these, as our author points out. But to do so successfully, and not to be swept away by the storm, the individual should have gained a certain maturity. Ego strength is the name psychologists give to it. It's to be feared that some of those drawn to contemplation do lack sufficient ego strength to be able to open themselves to the unconscious without being overwhelmed by it. Teachers, teachers of Eastern methods of meditation meditation have popularized certain methods of stilling active thinking, of which perhaps the best known is transcendental meditation. In TM, the meditator sitting in a relaxed posture continuously repeats the Sanskrit phrase that has been given to him. The constant repetition sends the active ego-directive thinking to sleep, leaving the individual uh, open to his unconscious depths. The relaxing effect of this exercise can be beneficial to health, but one who lacks sufficient ego strength may find himself carried away by lawless feelings and impulses. His mind may be gripped by anger, hatred, anxiety, depression. He is liable to become acutely depressed 
and to give up the whole spiritual enterprise as doing him harm. Another danger is that the pleasant feeling of relaxation which some meditation techniques bring about can lead to the welling up of a kind of infantile narcissism, a pleasure in self-contemplation. From this there follows a smug self-satisfaction very far removed from the little blind stirring of love reaching up to the cloud of unknowing, which is God. For this stirring of love opens us both to God and to our fellows, while the false self-regarding peace is essentially self-protective. It's a defense stratagem and creates a barrier of indifference between ourselves and our fellows. The old spiritual guides are well aware <coughs> of these dangers and insist upon the necessity of a spiritual guide, especially for the beginners in this way. The great number of books available today, to some extent, reduce the importance of a personal guide. But books can never wholly take the place of a wise director. A book cannot give the reassurance, the encouragement, and sometimes the warning that may be needed. It's possible to misread books and imagine mistakenly that an experience described there is the same as one's own. The surest test of the genuineness of our prayer is the fruit it bears in daily life. But it's difficult to judge these fruits in our own case. For one thing, it takes time for fruit to ripen. And it may be a long time before an inner change works itself out in our daily living. It's clearly an advantage to be able to turn to an experienced spiritual guide. Unfortunately, such guides are few and always have been. Some are finding a helpful alternative through membership of a small, intimate group whose members are all engaged in the spiritual quest. Such a group may be able to give the reassurance that the individual continually needs, as well as the common sense and realism to correct possible self-deception. I felt obliged to mention these dangers which our author stresses, but they will not deter those who have found that through the way of unknowing they are being drawn into a closer walk with God and a growing love for their fellows. It was intimated that he would be delighted to answer any questions that his paper has evoked. So please fire ahead now. In your talk, uh, you related spiritual knowledge to light self-understanding, which is true indeed, it's a matter of experience. In the Sermon on the Mount, we go up by stages, the tears of the beginning. And the final one, we know about at a certain stage, and then there's peace as the final stage. And then we may go out into the world without script or verse and preach truth. It, there seems to be no mention of peace in the clouds, I understand it, the report that you have given of it. There's something else I had in mind, but it's gone. <laughs> peace certainly is an idea that's very much in our minds today for all sorts of reasons. Um, um, I suppose it is that every age has its particular way of, of um, expressing its aims and ideals. I think love would be the thing that the, um, that the cloud would specially do, and love and peace are very close together. In fact, you can't have any real peace without love. Well, St. Augustine says, peace is the tranquility of order. And I think there's all sorts of false peace 
kind of you know, a sense of of well-being, um, which um, isn't the true piece. However, I think it's quite right. He doesn't say much, as far as I can remember, uh, about actual peace. But I think the thing is there without his mentioning it. <laughs>